the impotence of power and what to do when reality won't bend to your rhetoric, and if likely next British Prime Minister Liz Truss is serious about taking the information war to Russia, what else might it be worth her thinking about? I'm Mark Galliotti, and welcome to my view of Russia in Moscow's shadows. This podcast, of varying length, frequency and format, yet always reassuringly low production values, is supported by generous and perspicacious patrons, who also receive extra perks and bonuses appropriate to their tier. If you'd like to join them, just head on to patreon.com slash shadows. But now, on with today's programme. Now, I appreciate that there is one big story that clearly is rightly dominating the news about Russia, the war with Ukraine. But the thing that strikes me these days is actually just how damn hard it is to find news about what is going on in Russia other than connected to that conflict. And even if you look at specialist sites like RFERL, which often does sterling work, there does seem to be a degree to which actually pretty much every headline will have Ukraine in the title. And this got me thinking for several reasons. I mean, first of all, it's that it almost it seems to ignore the fact that stuff is going on inside Russia, stuff which is important, and stuff which may well be being shaped and framed by that conflict and things like the sanctions that follow, but is not necessarily about the Ukraine war. And I, I do worry that there is a certain myopia at work, that we might be missing stuff. And so that got me thinking, well, OK, how far is the Ukraine conflict also dominating the Russian press? So I just had a quick skim through all, well, not all, but many of the main news sites and newspapers this morning. And this is Sunday, the 28th of August. And this is what actually came out. And by the way, obviously, websites in particular tend to have rolling news. Um, so, you know, obviously, what may well be the, the top item now may well not be later. But anyway, let's start with the sort of official government paper of record, Rosiska Gazeta. Ukraine, well, the, the first Ukraine news is actually item three in their running order on the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, with the main story being an interview with the actor Yuri Solomin. Now, look, in part, that's just Rosiska Gazeta, which is stolid to the point of being pretty much turgid. But if we look at the tabloid Komsomolskaya Pravda, well, what's its uh, number one story? The central bank eases currency restrictions. It's easier to buy dollars and euros. Ukraine comes in number two, again, about the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. And on we go. Well, suddenly sort of it's, uh, the, the implications of the war are bubbling up. Commerçant, the, the uh, business newspaper, it's about the European Union's considerations of a visa ban. RBK, again, it's a rather more business-oriented, about Chinese purchases of Russian gold. Nezavisima Gazeta, it is about Ukrainian conflict and how it is increasing the commodity revenues of both Russia and the United States. It has to be said, you know, there is a point that the current environment is such, which is actually really quite good for American business at Europe's expense, but we won't go there. Izvestia, where their lead story is how the European Union's foreign policy chief, Josep Perel, is predicting serious challenges for the EU because of their anti-Russian sanctions. Now, I mean, this is, it's worth noting, a classic way in which the Russians spin things is they take him noting, you know, obviously that, that times are going to be hard and that will put pressure on uh, European Union unity. Um, but nonetheless, sort of spinning it much more as a sort of a, ne a negative story and I'll come on to that in a moment. What else? Well, if one looks at the news agency sites, which again do, do sort of move quite speed, TASS, um, it's about Roscosmos's cooperation with NASA in the field of spaceflight. Ria Novosti, uh, again, very much uh, this one, it's on, on Ukraine, um, and why ultimately you know, you, the West won't continue to support it. And Interfax bucks the trend, Tajik president uh, talks Afghanistan with the UN Secretary General. 
Now, there's a certain amount of variety about that. But what is really quite striking, and I think this is where I, I think I'd want to start moving on to next, is that actually if it talks about the war to a large extent, with the exception of talking about the Zaporizhia nuclear plant where the key issue is how the nasty Ukrainians are shelling it and risk causing all kinds of problems. But apart from that, it's very much about the degree to which the West is having problems because of the war, you know, because of the political fallout, the economic challenges and such like. And this is quite striking because it's really about the negatives of their perceived enemies rather than Russia's own positives. And I think this actually speaks to a growing policy dilemma for the Kremlin. And it is this. How do you cope politically when reality is not playing out along the way that you promised? And when you have essentially become a prisoner of your own rhetoric? Because after all, this is a challenge for Moscow. Look. It is not losing the war in Ukraine, but it is certainly not winning the war in Ukraine. And, you know, in the longer term, the omens look quite uh, confused, but not particularly encouraging. But that's not the way this was meant to be. This is not how it was sold to Russia. And although they tried different sort of ways of essentially spinning stalemate as triumph, because now, well, we're not just fighting Ukraine. Ukraine is just simply the sort of forward extrusion of the massive NATO alliance which is united against us. That's not really working all that well for two reasons. One is just it doesn't have much resonance with a lot of people. But secondly, do you really want to essentially tell your people that you are up against a vastly more powerful military, political and economic alliance? That's not exactly an uplifting prospect. So again, it's interesting how they keep using this but without really dipping too deeply into the implications. And as a result, I think there, there is a growing problem. And again, I really need to stress the following caveat. I'm not in a, for a moment going to be suggesting that we're going to be seeing protests on the streets in a fortnight and the Putin regime collapsing shortly thereafter. Anything like that? Of course not. However, and this is something, an obligatory plug, I wrote in a piece for today's Sunday Times. I'll leave a, a link in the program notes as usual. But the sense of, of growing frustration amongst a whole variety of different constituencies, often for their own very, very personal and specific reasons. So you can have the ultra hawks like Girkin Strelkov, who are thoroughly infuriated because of the amateurishness and failure of the attack. You actually have a whole variety of soldiers. We're getting an increasing flow of, sort of memoirs and accounts or just simply sort of cri de coeur from soldiers saying how ghastly the conditions were and how awful they feel about what they were forced to do. You have mothers of serving or potential servicemen who are concerned, particularly as it becomes clear that the state lies to them. And again, I think it's so fascinating that so many of the issues that are arising at the moment are ones that I came across when I was doing my PhD on the Soviet war in Afghanistan particularly the attempt by the state to lie at every turn. No, no, there isn't fighting. No, your boy is not actually in a war zone. And when it comes down to it, no, your boy didn't die in a war. He died in a training accident or, or similar. In all of these lies unravel. To say nothing of the lies that are actually told to the soldiers. Yes, we'll look after you. Yes, we'll take care of you. And yes, when you come back, we will still look after you, whether it's in terms of medical care, whether it's in terms of pensions, whether it's in terms of privilege access to flats and the like. And then, lo and behold, none of that actually happens. I mean, the, the stupidity and the callousness of a Kremlin which, despite multiple changes in regime and even notionally government philosophy, but nonetheless has not learnt the lesson that actually there is something deeply corrosive not just about lying to your own people, but about lying on things where you know you are going to be caught out. But still, th this is where we find ourselves. And so I think we're at this kind of what I would almost call pre-crisis level, that there may well be a, a general acceptance of the war. And I'd stress that, acceptance rather than necessarily enthusiasm. 
because of what they're told, because of the fact that this is a, a ruthless police state and it is dangerous not to believe what it tells you because if you don't believe, then that puts a moral incent uh, onus upon you to actually do something about it. So there may well be this kind of general broad level sense of, yeah, yeah, this is, this is where Russia is, this is where Russia has to be. But on the other hand, that can and does coexist with growing sectoral impatience with what's going on, a sense of frustration. I think that's it. Frustration is in many ways, I think, the, the, the best way of framing at it. You know, the way that the Kremlin is simply failing to deliver. Delivery, I mean, it's one of the most fundamental things for any government. It's meant to actually do things. So there is a sense that, yes, on the one hand, the Kremlin is ensuring that Russia copes you know, Russia is surviving. The economy is not collapsing. In its own dysfunctional way, it will function in the long term. But coping is not mastery. There is a sense that actually this, this is a government that really doesn't, doesn't have answers to the, to the fundamental problems and is taking that out on the people and failing. And I think this is really important because if one looks at key moments in, in Russian history, as in so many others, when governments come under pressure, particularly coming under pressure because of defeats in war, and whether we're talking about the 1905 revolution following the 1904-05 Russo-Japanese War, or whether we're talking about the two revolutions in 1917 that first brought down Tsarism and then saw the Bolsheviks seize power, or even if we're talking about the effective revolution at the end of 1991 that led to Gorbachev signing the Soviet Union out of existence, after the defeat in a primarily political and economic with occasional kinetic in certain proxy conflicts, does that sound familiar, Cold War. Well, in each of those cases, it's not on the whole that there was some national movement that united against the regime. Instead, when one looks down, it was vastly more granular. You know, if you take 1904-05, this, there was this disastrous war with Japan, which ironically enough had been predicted to be you know, a sure one thing. After all, how could a European power like the Russians fail against an Asian power like the Japanese? Well, of course, the Japanese had actually been arming and modernizing rather more purposefully and effectively than the Russians had and delivered a devastating defeat. And as a result of that, what we had was not what Interior Minister von Pleva had described was a nice, victorious little war that can actually reunite an increasingly fractious population, but quite the opposite. But again, the interesting thing is, if we're talking about the urban middle classes, if we're talking about actually members of the elite, if we're talking about the, the rural population, if we're talking about the soldiers, look, there are many, many groups, all with their own concerns, who are not sitting there conspiring together the 1905 revolution was not really a revolution as we think of it. We think of revolutions as precisely being acts of will and purpose, wherein some kind of revolutionary party or movement strikes against the government. This was just basically a whole bunch of people who had had enough. Mutinies within the military, huge array of strikes, growing emergence of nationalist movements against Tsarism in Poland, in the Caucasus region. You know, all, all of these happen at the same time, and from the point of view of a panic regime, they saw all these things happening and united them together as if it was one revolution, but instead it was just a nationwide outbreak of localized and specific strikes against the regime. And that's often w what happens. I mean, I said 1917, one, one can say that you know, the reason why Tsarism fell was, in, to a large extent, because the mighty, if not the great and the good, told Tsar Nicholas II that it was time he left for the good of the regimes and the system and the country as a whole. But again, it was because there was a whole, a whole disparate array of different forces who were beginning to mobilize against the regime. And likewise, at the end of the Soviet era, I mean, what's interesting is that who was opposed to, to Mikhail Gorbachev and his quixotic attempts to reform this system? Well, I mean, there were liberals who were saying he wasn't going far enough. There were hardliners who, was going, who were saying he was going too far. There was nationalists who actually saw this as their opportunity to break out of the prison of nations. 
time and time again, it's a whole variety of different groups which may not share anything in common except the fact that they're un unhappy with the regime. And that means that they're not willing to support it and will act in their own way. And I think this is significant because what we're seeing exactly is this kind of pre-crisis issue of lots and lots of groups that are beginning to think that they have their concerns. They don't see, I would suggest, a window of opportunity to do anything about it seriously. They will grumble and complain and they will vent on social media and in the case of organizations like the Council on so Soldiers Mothers which seeks to campaign for the rights of servicemen but also for their families, you know, they will act on, on humanitarian issues but very very specific cases. But that's not the same as some kind of larger organization against the state. But this is it. But you have therefore um, you know, in, 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 in being a potentiality, a potentiality for pressure. And I think this is something that is clearly concerning the government. But because the point is, it doesn't know what it can do. Its actual practical options to, to do anything are essentially limited by the resources at its disposal, the will and the imagination and the capacity of its leaders, and their own rhetoric, which, as I said, has kind of caged them into to a degree. And I did think this was exemplified by this week's edict on the military that uh, Putin promulgated, in which he decreed that the armed forces should add 137,000 soldiers to their current establishment strength of 1.13 million. Now, on one level, that sounds very dramatic. That sounds like a significant escalation. If all of a sudden Russia is in a position to be able to deploy another 137,000 soldiers, well, that, that's a big deal. That could actually have very serious impact on the battlefield. But, of course, there's always lots of buts here. And above all, it's this question of whether it's actually achievable. Now, look, on one level, this may just simply be a, an attempt to create a structure which recognizes the potential for incorporating the forces of the LDNR, the Lugansk and Donbass People's Republics, these are unrecognized pseudo-states who are currently doing a lot of the heavy fighting, quite frankly, Anyway, the, their incorporation into the Russian military with annexation. It can also reflect the fact that you know, all across the country, governors and in some cases mayors of major cities are being required to establish new volunteer battalions to throw into to the front. So you know, it, it could just simply be as a way of ensuring that, you know, that there is room, shall we say, within the formal legal establishment strength of the military to account for these. However, there's a question as to how far even these forces can actually even match the already estimated 70 to 80,000 Russian soldiers who have either been killed or wounded in action. So in other words, you know, are these forces not just simply making up for, for the losses rather than representing any kind of expansion? Particularly because we have to remember that even before the start of the war, the Russian military was at only 85% of its establishment strength. In other words, it was already 15%, which is more than 137,000 under strength at that point. Even in a time of peace, when people didn't face the risks of actually going into a meat grinder, they were having trouble recruiting enough soldiers. And that's only got harder now. So the notion that in any kind of meaningful time frame, the Russians can actually recruit another 137,000 thousand soldiers, as well as replenish their ranks to make up for their casualties, seems almost inconceivable. I mean, are they going to be offering massive salaries? Can they really afford to do so? Are they going to offer huge amounts of benefits? Well, the trouble is, it's becoming increasingly clear, and more to the point, increasingly well known, that they are not living up to their promises. There's only so far that you can, for example, rely on raising volunteer battalions, not least because what it does is it is actually focusing the pain of the war on relatively impoverished regions. Now, we've already seen that happening because you know, those people who joined voluntarily the military, bef especially before the war, tended to come from poorer parts of the Russian Federation, which tended also, incidentally, to be ethnically non-Slav. You know, the North Caucasus, parts of, of Siberia and so forth because these were impoverished and therefore people saw, well, I have no other alternative economic opportunities.
Well, now we're actually seeing, even with the volunteer battalions, that process taking place. The volunteer battalions one could almost describe as state mercenaries. And, you know, if you look at somewhere like Moscow, Moscow Mayor Sabyanin has been, you know, re- is being required to create this volunteer forces, even though he's clearly not at all enthused with, by the war. Moscow is relatively prosperous, relatively cosmopolitan, relatively sceptical of the regime. And therefore, not surprisingly, he's having trouble recruiting. So what's happened is actually Moscow's recruiters have been going to these poorer regions, non-Moscow regions, in order to find extra soldiers, in order to recruit people. Of course, because that's where the potential or the audience for their blandishments is. But again, so even you know, Moscow's forces will not actually be Muscovites. So I think you know, the, the, there is going to be a real pressure, you know, a real crunch on actually being able to find new recruits. Unless they're going to do something truly dramatic, such as calling a full mobilization, as apparently many generals want, which means that you can call up the reservists. I've talked in the past about how that has its distinct limitations. Whether you're going to extend conscription, perhaps make it more than one year, which, let's be perfectly honest, would make sense. I mean, there is a widespread assumption that, you know, amongst Russian officers, that essentially, you know, when you have a, a conscript for 12 months, By the time they've done their initial training, their unit training, and when you take out the last month where essentially they're just basically getting ready for demobilization, you've really only got them moderately trained and operational for about three to four months of that 12 months period. So if you actually made it two years or even just one and a half years, you are above all extending that operational period. But nonetheless, you know, it would be massively unpopular and it would also be a massive recognition of failure on the part of the regime. So I can understand why, why that's less likely. Maybe they will also nibble around the edges in terms of um, reducing the level of exemptions from conscription, which is already for you know, not just university students, but also people with a variety of health issues, sole support of aged mothers and all that kind of thing. But again, I mean, that's not likely to have this kind of sort of massive impact that, that would, would be needed. So, I mean, there's a limit to what can be done with the conscription system, and especially because, frankly, conscripts are not necessarily the best troops. And by law, they cannot be deployed in Ukraine unless they actively volunteer. So anyway, it's a question of how far that really would, would get you soldiers that you can use in this conflict. So, you know, time and time again, one, one comes about, about this point of, well, okay, how is this decree meant to work? And it's hard to escape the suspicion that it's not expected to work, that this is basically a piece of Potemkin politics. This is about a decree as, in effect, an alternative to action. It is about spin rather than policy. And I think that is something that we are seeing applying to a whole variety of different policy areas where actually the Kremlin feels unable to do more than carry out very, very minor palliative work but knows that isn't enough, so it has to talk big. And the thing about talking big is maybe in the short term it works. Maybe it makes people think, oh, it's all right, the Kremlin's on it, they're doing what needs to be done. But again, after a certain point, people begin to say, well, hang on. Where is this taking us? What actually came of these grand promises? If one looks at, for example, import substitution, the idea of we don't need to worry about sanctions because actually what it's going to do is it's going to be a great boost to our own domestic economy because our industries will start producing all these things that we used to import. Well, of course, that's not the case. I mean, we are seeing an assortment of different sort of shortages looming, including, I mean, most recently one, for example, about tin, as in with the use of tin cans. Now, it's these kind of real basic things that are actually the really crucial issues for the economy. You know, if you can't can food, then actually your agricultural produce risks getting wasted. Food isn't produced and, more to the point, isn't stored and saved in a, such a way that it can be moved around the country. You know, this actually has a real impact So import substitution for all the the grand talk. And there is some progress, it has to be said, as a result. But there is absolutely no way that the Russian economy can make up the shortfall. And this is something that even industrialists close to the Kremlin have been saying. Actually, it's it's, it's a couple of months back, for example, 
that uh, Chemizov, the head of Rostec, which is the sort of main defense uh, technology sort of conglomerate, really, but also Chemizov, ex KGB, very close to Putin personally, and so forth. You know, even he said that import substitution wasn't wasn't actually the the, the answer. And this is a, you know an absolute loyalist. What else? Well, again, what about the, all the huge um, administrative sort of techno-authoritarian breakthroughs that Prime Minister Mishustin was meant to bring to increase efficiency and honesty to the governance of, of the Russian system? We've heard the news that uh, the Russian state has now had to suspend the issue of biometric foreign passports. And why? Well, that's almost certainly because precisely of the necessary chips that are needed. Well, at the same time as that, there was meant to be this huge expansion of a new generation of high-definition, closed-circuit television cameras around Moscow and other major cities, which had the kind of you know, good quality definition, which means that you could run major facial recognition software programs off them, so that precisely malefactors of one sort or another could easily be tracked. Well, again, that's quietly bubbled off the radar, in part for financial reasons, but primarily, again, because those high-quality cameras were going to have to be sourced abroad, and you can't buy them anymore. So, I mean, I think there's all kinds of very, very kind of specific um, elements of the program which were meant to be for the administrative development of Russia, which have also quietly had to fall by the wayside, but the point is they were promised. We have the promise that basically the financial system will remain hale and hearty. And central bank chair Nabulina and others have done an amazing job of trying to ensure that that is indeed the case. But there is a degree to which this is about playing financial musical chairs. And at some point, the music stops. And again, I'm not talking about some kind of massive, um, catastrophic financial meltdown. But the pressures are indeed building up. You know, instead, what do we have? We have the attempt to find such crumbs of positive news as may be that almost sound pathetic in some ways. For example, it's just been announced that in the conquered city of Mariupol on the northern coast of the Azov Sea, the first traffic lights have got back into operation. Woo! I mean, apart from the fact that actually the, the, the TV footage didn't actually show traffic lights in, in, in operation. But what this speaks to is another one of the, the huge imbalances between promises and reality. The talk of the rapid reconstruction of the devastated conquered territories and cities um, in, in Ukraine. Well, I mean, it is clear that however much you know, various regions and cities are being uh, forced to take part in this, this is an incredibly slow, but above all, incredibly expensive process. The money, the resources, the people just simply are not there for that. I mean, arguably, after all, huge parts of, of Russia still need to have some kind of serious uplift. So, overall, we have this issue of the disconnect between promises and reality. We have a disconnect between rhetoric and the experiences that, that people are seeing around them. And as a result, I do think we can begin to, to detect two things. One is nervousness in the Kremlin, as a desperation to try and find good news stories, and if need be, a desperation to come out with big promises, like this edict on military numbers, to try and deal with the situation here and now. And again, this is a key thing. When you're at that state that you don't care too much about the problems, I don't know, six months, I'm just arbitrarily picking that figure, down the line, because you need to have something to say now, that says something about how few options you feel are at your disposal, that you're just desperate to deal with the day-to-day. -day. So I think that is, is, is a crucial thing, and more and more constituencies in their own big ways are beginning to recognize this. No, they're not uniting. We do not have a... Um, Strelkov, Council of Soldiers, Mothers, Alliance in the uh, offing. But instead, it creates this increasingly uh, sort of problematic political environment in which more than anything else, fewer and fewer people feel they have a stake in the status quo. And that doesn't matter for most of the time. When you are a, a ruthless police state, as this is, basically you don't need to rely on the consent of the governed. 
But it does mean that when there is a crisis that actually brings that, that whole capacity to control the masses into question, well, then you may well find that you are already in a position in which you haven't necessarily lost the struggle, but you're in a much, much nastier position in order to wage that struggle than you were otherwise. So again, and, I know, I mean, and I'm saying this on the 28th of August, and it's worth noting, I just want to re-up my suggestion that it's September, which is only in a few days' time, September when the, the real pain of sanctions will start, and I would stress that, start, to be felt by most Russians. So we're going to have to see. It's not that I wish it upon them at all, but on the other hand, I think that we should not look retrospectively at the Kremlin's capacity to manage the country and the situation for the past six months and assume that we can actually project onwards and that it'll be just as easy for the next six months. The West, we are going to have a tough winter. There's no question as we watch our fuel bills rocket sky high. But let's not assume that Russians are also not, in different ways, they're also going to have a very rough winter too. And that's a challenge for the Kremlin. But speaking of challenges to the Kremlin, and also speaking about the gap between rhetoric and reality, let's have a break and then let me talk about potential British policy in a new truss era. Just the usual reminder, you're listening to the In Moscow Shadows podcast. You can support it by going to patreon.com slash in Moscow Shadows. And remember that patrons get a variety of additional perks as well as knowing that they're supporting this peerless source on all things Russian. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Mark Galliotti or on Facebook, Mark Galliotti on Russia. Now, back to the show. Now, barring some particularly extraordinary upset in the uh, polling of Conservative Party members, Liz Truss will soon be the new British Prime Minister replacing Boris Johnson. And this is something that, that the Russians are, are clearly aware of because they have stepped up their, you know, often quite... Uh, it would almost be funny were it not so offensive, um, rhetoric about her. Um, you know, if we look at, for example, Vladimir Solovyov, who is the, pretty much generally the, the gold standard of barking mad and thoroughly unpleasant Russian pundits. He's accused her of delusions of grandeur. And, and this, is, this is really quite splendid rhetoric. Such phantasmagoric audacity is unheard of since the time of the Tatars and the Mongols. Who does she think she is? Millie for her challenging Russia's position. Um, Salaviov, it's worth noting after all, is the person who has taken you know, Olaf Scholz of Germany, who frankly many would regard as having been a pretty good friend of Russia in, in, in effect. Um, and, and has called Schultz, uh, you know, some of you have called Schultz uh, a disciple of Hitler. Um, so, you know, it, it's worth noting that uh, in, in many ways, Salaviov is an equal opportunities lunatic. Um, then we have a quote unquote analyst on the TV channel Rasia One, uh, who said, you know, a splendid little bit of cliched misogyny that Liz Truss doesn't belong in politics but in the kitchen. Um, and indeed, he sort of suggested that she should uh, stop behaving like a, I suppose, fishwife would be the best translation of Khabalka. Um, anyway, stop behaving like a fishwife at a political striptease show, which incidentally is one of the most bizarre and disturbing um, metaphors I've heard for a while. Um, oh, and by the way, I mean, if, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you really should be following Francis Scar of BBC World Service Me Monitoring um, on, on Twitter. I, again, I will put a, a link in, in the show notes um, because he does provide us all with a, a, a regular diet of such lunacies and inanities. Anyway, look, the reasons why the Russians are, are, are getting so offensively up in arms about trust is that even by the standards of the British government, she has been a very forceful critic of Russia's and a cheerleader for Ukraine's. And you know, to, to this end, they're clearly concerned about quite uh, what she will do to policy, or at least the fact that she will not be in any way diluting Britain's you know, very, very profound support for Ukraine's struggle for its own freedom. And... Most recently, Liz Truss wrote a piece in Tuesday's Telegraph, again, I'll, I'll include links to it, in which she talked about the, the need to fight back against uh, 
Kremlin disinformation. So un under the headline, Britain will expose Putin's lies to the world. Again, one always has to be cautioned, cautious. Headlines are often more the result of what a sub-editor uh, wants to see rather than that. But, you know, in, in the actual text, we have you know, where there are lies, they will be exposed. Where there is barbarism, we will call it out. Under my leadership, our support will be resolute. I mean, I, I will be honest, it is in many ways not an impressive article in the sense of it is a considerable degree of uh, mix of cliché and self-promotion, which is precisely what one tends to expect from politicians' op-eds, though it's always dis disappointing to find it. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is just kind of over the top and so forth. That's fine. Again, you know, this, this is a piece of politics rather than a piece of policy. However, she does talk about this need to struggle against Russian disinformation and propaganda, and just generally sort of Russia's narrative conflict. But what does she actually propose in the article? Well, there's two things, really, beyond a sort of just a general, you know, we will always call them out. One of them is the you know, basically support for the already set up government information cell says, to counter the Kremlin's false narratives. Um, so in other words, we're talking about sort of counter disinformation. And the other concrete proposal or uh, expectation is that Britain will continue to declassify certain intelligence findings in order, again, to, to undermine the, the Kremlin's narrative. Uh, and that's pretty much it in terms of the information struggle. Well, in that case, OK, I, I will take her at face value and assume that she really does not only believe that, that the UK is part of a wider political conflict against Russia, very, very hard to deny that. But more to the point that, in fact, this information and narrative conflict is going to be an important element of, of British policy. Well, first of all, look, um, the government information cell, I'm, I'm really sceptical about the importance of these things or the value. Yes, it, it, it's good to have them, but let's not overplay their importance. This is back to the whole realm of trying to basically um, counter disinformation with reality. And there's so much evidence, first of all, that that just doesn't work. The kind of people who are willing to believe Russian propaganda over what's being said by their own mainstream media, their own government and so forth, are not likely to change their mind just because... And here is a government information announcement. What you believed was wrong. No, quite the opposite. If anything, it actually... Um, reinforces their belief. Ah, oh, if they weren't worried about this, if there was no smoke without fire and so forth, then why would they be saying this? No, actually, I mean, it, it, it's a lot more complex trying to deal with, with, with disinformation, and really it starts more with, with pre-bunking and proofing your people against disinformation, part of which is actually not lying to people. Um, you know, a, a massive, a massive move forward in terms of making our populations less vulnerable to malign disinformation would be, quite frankly, if our politicians, our government, and so many others within public life did not lie routinely. Um, and therefore, we have a situation which no one knows quite whom to believe. And a second point I would make about these kind of sort of counter-disinformation structures is they can run the risk of essentially becoming disinformation structures on the other side. And, and this is something that, that you know, I've noted and others have noted about the EU's um, EU versus disinformation site, that you know, although I'm, you know, it is clearly motivated by the best of all uh, intentions, but nonetheless in its desire to mock and push back against Russian disinformation, it comes, let's put it tactfully, pretty damn close to the point of, of being a disinformation outlet in its own right. So, I mean, I think, again, this is, this is you know, something that has to be done, but it's also something that needs to be treated with caution and shouldn't be overplayed. And then the point about declassifying intelligence. Um, that actually, I mean, as we saw with the, the whole sort of build-up to the, the actual in Russian invasion, that can indeed be a very useful and interesting tactic to use. It has, I would suggest, though, rather kind of limited opportunities in which it can be used, both because of the need to protect your own sources and methods, and also because you need to be in a situation where there is something that will objectively be demonstrated later. You know, if you just simply say, look, trust me, our spies tell us that this is the case. Again, it's very, very difficult to actually assume that everyone will believe you. Unless then that, that comes out, and then the next time maybe they'll be more willing to, to accept you on face value. So, again, I think this is another thing which is good, but I would suggest not enough.
So let me suggest about some other things. And some other things which, it has to be noted, will in some cases cost money. Not always, but some of them will cost money. Liz Truss has also committed to increasing Britain's defence spending to 3% of GDP, which, I mean, I think, however much I don't like paying taxes any more than anyone else, you know, I, I think is a proper recognition of the fact that we are in a fairly sort of dangerous world, and 2% I think probably just wasn't enough. However, defence spending is all very well. The real struggles we face at the moment tend to be non-kinetic. You know, we need to have a certain level of military capacity to ensure that that, is, that remains the case. But nonetheless, you know, if we look at our struggle with, with Russia, you know, this is not a military struggle, not between the West and Russia. There is a very nasty military struggle taking place in Ukraine, but then there is, in, in effect, a second parallel war, which is the political and economic one that Russia is waging with the West and vice versa. And to that end... I mean, what I would also like very much to see is a commitment to a greater spending on intelligence and counterintelligence. I mean, I really cannot be, I think, uh, overstressed the degree to which these are our, you know, key assets in terms of protecting our countries and our allies and also in gauging the potential intent and threat that we face from, from ab abroad. Now, Britain has tended to do historically quite well in terms of spending on this, which is one of the reasons why, why Britain is, is still, I wouldn't say an intelligence superpower, but I would say an intelligence great power. If one looks at so many European countries, it's got to be said that just as many of them have fallen behind in terms of their defence spending, not even meeting their NATO-mandated minimum commitment of 2% of GDP, the discrepancy in intelligence and counterintelligence spending is even more dramatic. So anyway, but you know, putting aside them, that, that's their issue. But I, I, I think that the UK, we need to have a, th a think about what we spend on intelligence and counterintelligence. And bear in mind that in relative terms, these are services are, with the, with the exception of GCHQ, the Electronic Intelligence Agency. But the human intelligence, the human security counterintelligence capacities, that's you know, SIS or MI6, and the security service, MI5, respectively, is incredibly cheap. You know, if you think of the cost of one modern jet fighter and quite how much of, of a game-changing sort of shift of, of, of budgets adding that to, say, SIS is, I mean, you know, it, it really is quite striking. So that's something I would like to see some focus on. Secondly, there is currently a big struggle on so-called sort of counter-kleptocracy work, particularly being focused by the National Crime Agency. And again, I think, I think this is really important and obviously massively overdue. And if you look at the work of people like Oliver Bullo, who really, again, I'll, I'll include a link, um, you know, who really spent a lot of time very, very effectively uh, demonstrating most recently in his latest book uh, called, I believe, Butler to the World. Surely I should have checked that beforehand. Um, but nonetheless, the, the, the degree to which, which Britain has in many ways been precisely the, the, the kleptocrat's best friend. So yes, absolutely, let's address that. Let's see more money and more effort being put into attempts to prosecute. Let's see the, the, the fundamental moves in terms of ensuring that uh, you know, companies that are registered in companies' house really are run by who they say they are and run out of the offices that they claim. Let's see a clear commitment to ensuring that we can find out for certain who is the ultimate owner of property and companies. All of these things are really important, but again, we have to decide, is this just simply using anti-kleptocracy as a weapon against Russia and Russians? Or are we serious about it? Because if we're serious about it, it means not only going after Russians. It also means going after the dirty money that might come out of, of China or Nigeria or India or indeed Liechtenstein or the United States. You know, I mean, so, so basically dirty money is dirty money. And if we just simply use this to target the Russians, then actually we are going to be putting out the message that we are not against kleptocracy. We are actually fine with kleptocracy. What we are is an enemy of the Russian kleptocracy. And, and that, I think, actually would, would, would be very corrosive on, on, on several levels. So, yes, absolutely, let us put more effort, legal as well as financial, in, into combating kleptocracy, but let us also make it clear that this is a genuine campaign 
rather than just simply using it as a particular weapon against Moscow today because we decided that, that the Russians are, are the baddies. And that links to, I think, the, the third, and I think for people who know the sort of what, what a bleeding heart I am on this issue, the kind of most predictable element of, of the narrative conflict is it's not just simply about resisting, defeating, and countering Russian messaging. We also have to have a positive message of our own, and we also need to reach out with it. We need to be thinking of this precisely as narrative warfare. And as in all kinds of warfare, you ultimately do not generally win wars by purely being on the defensive. And Russia is you know, obviously very, very active in trying to use this largely to disrupt, divide, and demoralize us in the West. Um, you know, again, if you go back to what I was saying right at the beginning about w what are the messages that are appearing, not just in, in terms of Russian domestic news messaging, but also in terms of Russia's international news services. You know, it is all about the weaknesses and the problems of the West. It's all about the, you know, the, the challenges that are coming, the high prices, the potential for social disaffection and even unrest, and, and, and essentially trying to kind of convey to, to Russians, don't worry, they're not going to last long. We just have to put up with this for a little while and then the West will crumble. But also, in effect, to convey the same message to the West. That, look, this, you know, ultimately, are you willing to see your whole system destroyed just for Ukraine? So, you know, we, we, we need to be aware that obviously we have to resist that, but we also have to push back. We also have to have our own, our own narrative um, messages and so forth. And that means, obviously, yes, reaching out. I mean, you know, again, if one looks at, for example, BBC Russian Language Service, which, you know, has faced so much pressure in the past, but actually, you know, remains, I would suggest, one of the most powerful weapons in our arsenal. But of course, Russians have trouble you know, get, getting, getting the news or whatever as the Russian state tries to clamp down on things. We should be thinking creatively in other ways. I mean, for example, you know, many Russians use VPNs, um, which are a way whereby you, in effect, make it look on your, as if your computer is not where it actually is. So basically, instead of seeming to be in, I don't know, an outskirt of Irkutsk, you can actually claim that you are in Nottingham. And th that allows you access to, to sites that the Russians are trying to block to Russians. The thing is that VPNs often cost money, generally cost money. So maybe we should be thinking about ways in which actually Russians could, could be able to download and use VPNs for free, or even just simply for free if they're accessing certain sites. You know, again, I think we need to be creative. If this is a war, then by all means, let us fight this narrative war. Let us do so not with lies, not with disinformation, but with the truth. Because, well, why not take advantage of the fact that actually, arguably, I'd say, for, you know, for once, we're the good guys. We're on the right side. Sure, not everything about Ukraine is, is, is beautiful and wonderful. Not every Ukrainian policy has always been as sensible or as effective as it might be. None of that really matters, though. As of the 24th of February, as of the point when, when Russia invaded, then there is no more kind of uh, moral neutrality in this situation. So, yes, let us see how we can reach out to Russians, how we can take advantage of the extraordinary Anglophilia there is still amongst ordinary Russians. And I know someone's actually sort of, some people bridle at the term ordinary Russians. I haven't got a better term for Russians who are not connected to the state apparatus. If anyone has got one, please, by all means, send it my way, because I just still think ordinary is better than average Russian, which implies some kind of mathematical process. Anyway, I digress. But there is still a very, very strong pro-English, pro-British feeling amongst Russians. Let's take advantage of that, not in a hostile way. I mean, again, let us reach out to ordinary Russians and, and make them clear to them that we have a problem with the Kremlin, not them. But also, I mean, uh, if, if we're also going to be thinking about warfare, which is sometimes about sneakier and, and, and more negative things, let us, talk, let us also take advantage of the strange parallel assumptions there are ab about Britain. You know, alongside this Anglophilia, there is what one could almost call a certain type of Anglophobia, in that there is such an, an, a still an assumption that Britain remains Russia's most subtle antagonist.
that we are the schemers behind so much that goes wrong. I mean, it's interesting just how quickly after the assassination of Ms. Dugina that people suggested not just that Britain, like America, were essentially in charge of, of Kiev, and thus that therefore we clearly would have been the instigators, or at the very least the approvers of the uh, alleged assassination by this uh, you know, Ukrainian assassin with 12-year-old and cat in tow. Again, I think really the film rights ought to be being auctioned off right now. But that then when documents appeared, you know, the, the idea of, sort of the various sort of forged documents appeared, there was a suggestion that clearly they, they may well have been provided by MI6. You know, what, anything that goes wrong, someone will suggest that it was actually the shadowy hand of perfidious Albion that, that was behind it. Well, that's fine. Maybe at times, actually, we ought to be playing to that. We ought to be trying to get the Kremlin to feel all the more paranoid, all the more concerned about the risks of going up against, against Britain. I mean, you use whatever weapons are at your disposal. But more, more than the sort of uh, the nasty side of things, as I said, I think, I think they, they, there ought to be positive sides of things. And obviously, for example, this feeds into uh, an issue I've talked about before, the current debate about a blanket visa ban for tourists coming from Russia. Well, look, let's be perfectly honest. When you apply for a visa, you have no guarantees that you'll get it anyway. I absolutely agree that we should be denying access to people who are propagandists of the state, cheerleaders of the war, or anyone we have any particular doubts about, if we're thinking that they might be some kind of spy or, or similar. Indeed, we might want to be rather more specific in terms of certain categories of people whom we regard as worthy of being taught a lesson. I mean, I, I could see, for example, us simply saying, look, if you are a police officer or the family of a police officer, you will not get a visa. Same if you are the, a professional soldier, in other words, not a conscript or whatever. You know, because these actually give some kind of sense of it is what you do rather than who you are that means that we target you. But this idea that basically Russians as a whole should be taught a lesson Russians as a whole should be taught that we are angry about what their state is doing. Look, they know. Think of all those articles in the Russian press about sanctions, about the iniquities of the West and so forth. They carry right at the center the fact that the West is doing things against Russia because of what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Now, of course, the state is saying that that is terribly wrong and that we in the West are defending a fascist regime and all that kind of thing. But the point is, they cannot and aren't even trying to disguise the fact that there is a moral judgment being presented by Western actions on, on Russian activity. So, you know, let's not pretend this is going to come as some kind of politically significant epiphany to Russians if all of a sudden they are barred from entry. The point is that, you know, most Russians, it has to be stressed, feel that they have no option but to submit to a state that is, let's be honest, a brutal and ugly police state. They cannot demand change. They cannot protest on a mass level. I mean, if anything, the story is just how amazing it is that so many Russians have found ways, overtly and covertly, of protesting the war, and that so many Russians, as a result, have been arrested, imprisoned, fined, and, and such like. Most of us are not heroes. Most of us are perfectly happy from the safety of the West to say, why aren't Russians doing more? When, frankly, we need to ask ourselves whether we really would be doing anything else. So, yes, this is a, a police state. And if we return back to this issue of potential British options, you know, we have to do everything we can to try and undermine that. And, yes, so it, that might be visa bans for cops. That might be ways of, for example, encouraging subversion in a, a more sly and uh, uh, less confrontational way. Take, for example, what happened in Serbia at the end of the 1990s, when under Slobodan Milosevic, Sl well, Yugoslavia, Serbia, was, a, again, an unpleasant police state. And you had this movement called Otpor, 
which very much look to not just um, civil disobedience and so forth, but particularly at the use of humor. Humor as a weapon against distinctly humorless states. There are all kinds of lessons we can learn about how we can support and encourage the Russians without necessarily feeling that it's simply a matter of just beaming propaganda their way and without actually demanding that they come out on the streets to face the uh, truncheons and and rubber bullets of, of the National Guard. Because we do have to look beyond the war. And again, I think you know, this is the last element of, of, of the sort of narrative war strategy that I would like to see Britain adopt if Liz Truss is actually serious about what she says. And that is that we also have to be looking beyond the war at how we make sure that we do not lose Russians. Look, I've talked about that in the past. I'm not going kind to of keep, on, keep on going about that. But I do think that what we do in the war will be crucial in defining our relationship with Russia after the war. And we need always to be thinking about that. Because let's be honest, this is not like Germany in 1945. There is not going to be some kind of Marshall Plan for Russia. Quite the opposite, actually. We will probably be finding ways of making Russia pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine. And, for the record, quite right, too. It may well be in terms of using resources and assets which have been sequestered and frozen in the West or whatever else. But one way or the other, Russia is not going to be facing that kind of a um, campaign to win it over as, as West Germany did in 1945. So we have to be thinking about other ways in which we ensure that the next generations of Russians and Russian leaders do not feel angry and slighted. And particularly, I mean, I think the UK, this is obviously about a struggle, the West versus Russia, but this is also about the UK positioning itself for the future. This is about the UK ensuring that when there is a, I won't say entirely liberal, happy, prosperous Russia, no, but one that is more open, more flexible, more receptive than Putin's, not the highest bar, that actually Britain specifically is well-placed to take advantage of that, to, to rebuild the political, the economic and social connections and such like. We can do that. We can because it'll be taking advantage of what are already our positions, our cultural positions, our assets in Russia. But the main thing is, and again, I, I'm sorry I'm, ha- I'm hammering this home, but it's a bit of a hobby horse issue of mine. We need to be thinking about the long term now. We need to be thinking in terms of narrative warfare and also in due course narrative post-war reconstruction. The paradigms we've become used to for kinetic warfare also need to apply to non-kinetic warfare. And now I shall clamber down from my soapbox and and end this podcast. Thank you all very much, as ever, for listening and uh, (laughs) indulging me in my rants. Well, that's the end of another episode of the In Moscow Shadow podcast. Just as a reminder, beyond this, you can follow my blog, also called In Moscow Shadows. Follow me on Twitter, at Mark Galliotti, or Facebook, Mark Galliotti on Russia. This podcast is made possible by generous and enlightened patrons, and you too can be one. Just go along to my Patreon page, that's patreon.com slash In Moscow Shadows, and decide which tier you want to join, getting access to exclusive materials and other perks. However, whether or not you contribute, thank you very much indeed for listening. Until next time, keep well.